Hi folks, you know I stopped doing that today's t-shirt thing, but since nobody can see what t-shirts I'm wearing all the time, it's really sad. Here's today's. Heavily meditated. Alright, so the other day somebody sent me an email and said, Hey Brad, what's your next book going to be about? And I said, that's a good question, because I don't know. But I thought I'd make this little video to try to briefly discuss, or talk about, uh, discuss is weird because I'm not, anyway, um, to talk about what uh, ideas I had. Now, I mentioned before this in some video, I think that I had this idea to do a UFO-related novel that would be something, uh, a UFO story that I've had in mind for a long time. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is to explore a certain idea that as I think and think and think about it, I come to realize, well, the UFO, uh, the scenario of doing it through a story about UFOs is actually still seems like it might be a good idea, but it might not be the best idea. Because what I really want to talk about isn't UFOs, but something much more related to the way Buddhism is understood in America today. I've often mentioned this book, A. Hey Dogen, Mystical Realist, which was formerly titled Dogen Keegan, Mystical Realist by Hee Jin Kim. I've never actually read this book, you know, cover to cover. I dip into it here and there to find certain ideas and, and bring things up when I'm writing another book, but I, I've kind of made a, a vow to, to just slog my way through this sucker. The thing I like most about this book, having not read 100% of it, I've read maybe, you know, 30% of the book, is the title. Mystical Realist, because I think that is a tremendously good description of what Dogen was and what he was all about. The reason I bring this up is because it's mystical and realist. And in the past few years, there's been a spate of books and articles and things and that the, probably the best example of is a book called Why Buddhism is True. You're eating a leaf? The dog is eating a leaf. I guess I'll just leave, let him eat a leaf. Anyway, the, um, this book, Why Buddhism is True, I've never read it, but it's in every bookstore in the airports when I travel. So I've, I've picked it up and I've leafed through it a bunch of times. And just before I did this video, I decided to, to take a look at the, on the excerpt that Amazon has from the book just to make sure I'm right about the book. And even though I haven't read 100% of the book, I think I can, I can you know, I know what it is. Uh, it's, it's a guy who's, uh, what is he, an evolutionary biologist or something like that by trade. And he went on a 10-day Vipassana retreat. And, you know, he's a big deal, you know, writes for the New Yorker and everybody's, he's one of these writers that everybody thinks is tremendous. And those kind of writers, I never get it. Whenever I read them, I'm just like, this is the tremendous writing that you think is... Anyway, uh, so so I read the, tra the uh, excerpt thing and, and the idea is Buddhism is true because Buddhism is the only religion in the world that supports my uh, materialistically inclined view of a me mechanistic, materialistic universe. So it's the only religion that will fit in with a mechanistic, materialistic idea of how the universe works, and that's why Buddhism is true. And I have to say that one of the reasons I got into Buddhism in the first place was because of ideas like that that were kind of out in the, you know, even then in the atmosphere in the 80s, you know. Uh, the idea that Buddhism was compatible with a scientific worldview because I didn't like the anti-scientific worldview that I found in Christian churches that I visited in Ohio in my younger years. You know, they were, they were forever trying to prove that evolution wasn't true and, and stupid things like that. I mean, they're still doing that. There's that museum in uh, Kentucky uh, that, that tries to prove that the dinosaurs coexisted with humans and all this stuff. I've got a few, because I collect dinosaur books, I've got a couple at home, books, uh, dinosaur books written by creationists, and they're fascinatingly weird things, you know, because they'll, they'll try to prove, among other things, that the Loch Ness Monster is real, because if the Loch Ness Monster is real then then evolution must be wrong and stuff like that it's, there's so much dumb stuff in those books that that's really interesting in its in its uh, you know it's cleverly dumbness you know so I didn't like that and 
what I liked about Buddhism is you didn't have to believe in a whole weird mythological structure of the universe that included, you know, a, a flood that Noah had his ark on and Jesus ascending to heaven and, and all these things that were, you know, just kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know how I can believe that. You know, we, we can't prove who killed JFK. How do we <laughs> prove that Jesus rose from the dead? You know, it, it's, it's uh, not... The, evidence is very, you know, limited, uh, to say the least. So that's one of the things that got me into Buddhism, and so I do understand the popularity of a book like Why Buddhism is True. But on the other hand, as I delve deeper and deeper into Buddhism and what it means, and I continue doing my practice, and I continue seeing how things are, and I get a little bit more depth in my understanding of the universe and everything and how it works and all this stuff, it's clear to me that Buddhism is not really that compatible with this mechanistic, materialistic view of the universe. It, it, isn't, it doesn't fight against it. That's one of the great things about Buddhism. It, 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 well, there are probably some orders of Buddhism that do this that I don't know about, but in general, you don't find Buddhists trying to fight and prove that their cosmology is true and, you know, that, that the scientific cosmology is fake. Uh, but, you know, so, so they won't fight against it, but at the same time, there's this kind of background understanding that yeah, you guys say that's the way things are, but, you know, um, you know, things might not be that way, you know. And the, which is kind of how I approach it. And one of the books I've been reading on the current lockdown is Buddhist Cosmology. I've had this book for a couple of years, and I've just, you know, it's one of these things I've been always getting around to reading. And it's a very good, detailed a account of... Buddhist cosmology, the Buddhist ideas of what the universe is, where it came from, how it's structured, and all that. And what you get in here is not all that compatible with the scientific worldview. Here's just a cute little example, almost picked at random. This is a, a bird's eye view of Mount Sumeru realm, and it's, it's a kind of a Buddhist idea of how the universe is with this mountain in the middle and surrounded by these oceans and uh, mountain ranges and water circles and, and things like that. There are multiple levels of heavens and hells. There's a kind of universe cosmology of creation and destruction, which is actually compatible with some contemporary versions of, of, of cosmology in which the Big Bang expands and then contracts. And I know that there is some debate these days about whether the Big Bang either, either expands forever and, or if it contracts. And I think the expands forever until everything is dead version is the one that's winning out right now. But it goes back and forth anyway. Anyway, so the point is... Uh, trying to reconcile these Buddhist cosmological ideas with, you know, contemporary scientific ideas is a losing battle. You know, every once in a while somebody tries to write a book that, that tries to shore them up and, and prove that one proves the other and all this stuff. And those are silly and I don't want to read those and I certainly don't want to write one of those. But I am interested in writing about that idea, about the idea that maybe... Buddhism isn't all that compatible with a materialistic outlook. The way I tend to understand it is that you have an idealistic sort of view. This is sort of Nishijima's way of looking at it, Nishijima Roshi's way. Uh, you, you have an idealistic sort of view, which, which everything is ideas, and, and the um, Yogacara school of Buddhism is often identified with that, although you know, we could dispute whether it's actually truly idealism or not, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and then you have a materialistic point of view. And the materialistic point of view obviously works in a lot of cases, and a lot of very important cases. And the number one example, my favorite go-to example, is, is what you're doing right now. You are watching this probably on a laptop computer. I'm definitely recording it on a laptop computer. computer which is a, a marvelous example of what you can do with a materialistic outlook on the world. Because this, this uh, little MacBook Air that I'm recording this thing on wouldn't be possible except if there is 
at least some degree of reliability and truth to the materialistic mechanistic outlook of how the universe works because it's all based on putting things together according to scientific you know theories about how electricity travels between this and that and atoms and blah 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 you know I, I don't know all the details of it but I know that this thing works and that it wouldn't work it, it's not just magic you know so so there is that but Buddhism also deeply, deeply questions the idea that the materialistic, mechanistic understanding of the universe is the final answer. And a book like Why Buddhism is True and articles that come around that and, you know, probably the work of Sam Harris and people like that assume that the materialistic, mechanistic view of the universe is absolute and final and end of story. Whereas the Buddhist point of view is not like that. And, you know, this was one of the ideas I had to, when I was working on the UFO book, I'm still sort of half assedly working on the UFO book, but it might turn into something else. But the, the idea of using that as a way to get into some of these sort of spookier ideas that are implied within Buddhism. Like, like just to go back to our mystical realist Dogen, uh, he's, he's a realist, you know, he's very interested in what works and what's practical and what's applicable to the most people and so on and so forth. So he's definitely a realist, but he's also a mystic, you know, he does not look at the world the way a 21st century American looks at the world. And you could say, well, he's a medieval Japanese, so that's why he doesn't do it that way. Well, yeah, but he also did a lot of work on himself, and he has an extraordinary level of insight. And that insight is not a trivial thing to just sort of be discounted and to say that, well, when he talks about, you know, uh, demons and other realms and, and uh, beings in the six realms and, you know, some of these other weird things that he'll pull from the, you know, the Buddhist cosmology, uh, that he's, he's just a, you know, that's just him being a dumb old peasant from a long time ago and that's why he believes these silly things but you know we know that's not true i think there's a little bit more to it than that but at the same time i don't want to make like a, a war against modernism and and uh, the scientific method and all of that because obviously that's true too so you can see my dilemma maybe i i don't know if if this book is even possible to be written, but it's the book I would like to see written. It's the book I'd like to see kind of come out from a person who's steeped in a, you know, a contemporary materialistic, mechanistic view of the universe, me, this guy, who has also delved into Buddhism to a degree that people like the guy who wrote Why Buddhism is True or people like Sam Harris, they, they just haven't. You know, the, Sam Harris has a little bit of a grounding in it, but, but the guy who wrote Why Buddhism is True, he went to a 10-day Vipassana retreat. That's what he knows about Buddhism. You know, and then he makes a bestseller about it. You can see that I'm a little jealous of the fact that, that somebody who does a single Vipassana retreat gets a bestseller that's on the New York Times book list and is talked about on every TV show in America. And, and I, I've made a, a lifetime of Buddhist study and, you know, people are just like, yeah, there's one of, one of that, that guy's books. <laughs> let's, let's put it over here in the back. Anyway, that's how life is, and I guess that's my karma, and, you know, whatever. At least it keeps me from being rich, which is serious. I don't really want to be rich and famous. I, I think that would be a big problem. But if you want to make me rich and famous, you can donate via PayPal and Patreon. And as I keep saying, with the crisis going on with the uh, pandemic and the uh, isol uh, what are we calling the lockdowns and all this, I know a lot of people are struggling. So don't worry about me. Most of the people who donated before are still donating. Uh, you know, it's a little, but it's it's mostly still there. So you don't need to worry. But and if you want to, you know, suspend your donations or make them smaller, whatever, that's fine. But I do appreciate those of you who are still donating. I like that a lot. That keeps me busy. The dog just got a toothbrush from somewhere. I have no idea how he got a toothbrush, but I better go and take it away from him. And I'll see you next time that I see you. See you around. Bye.